Hello, everyone. So excited to have you here today for our session on creating engaging tasks and fostering an environment of learning. So today is really all about student voice, student choice, giving our students the ability to go beyond our standard measures of learning and really having them choose. So we're going to focus on three products today, Sway, Flipgrid, and Minecraft. Now, keep in mind that we're not going to have time to really deep dive into each of these, but just give you an idea of the possibilities. And then, as always, you can go visit the Microsoft Educator Center to take more classes or courses on these three topics. There's three great ones. Actually, there's four really good courses right in the Microsoft Educator Center. There's one on Sway. There's a really fun one on Minecraft Education Edition, and then uh, two on Flipgrid getting started with Flipgrid and then beyond the basics. So be sure to go check those courses out in the Microsoft Educator Center. The last 15 minutes of this session, I will be answering any questions that you might have regarding any of the topics that we're covering today. But as always, you're welcome to post anything in the chat window, and then I'll address those right at the end of our call. Or you'll have the ability to come off mute and ask any questions. All right, let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to start with Sway because Sway is probably the easiest of all of the tools to start with. Sway was created by Microsoft several years ago, and it's really taken off in education for teacher use. Uh, and it's now really starting to make its way into the hands of our students. So to access Sway, you log into office.com. And then you're going to choose the Sway icon from the menu on the left. Or you can go to your waffle and look for Sway. Now, Sway is like an online presentation program, but you don't need anything but the internet to play it. So um, the cool thing is, is when you send the link to your presentation to share with someone, um, they can watch it on their phone, they can watch it on their iPad, they can watch it on their computer. So many different ways that they can um, view this presentation. Unlike PowerPoint, where you've got to have PowerPoint to see it, with Sway, you don't. All right, so let's go ahead and look first at what a Sway actually looks like. I've kind of given you an overview, but I've got a presentation here on the Red Panda. And I said presentation, that's correct, but it's a Sway. Notice that it's completely web-based. And if I had a touch device, I could actually swipe through this presentation. Because I don't have a touch device for this session, I'm going to use the navigation arrows down on the bottom right-hand corner of my screen. I'm going to go ahead and click the arrow. It's going to take me to my next card, which you'll find out what a card is here in just a little bit. Uh, so I'm going to find out what is a red panda. Here's some information about this uh, presentation. And then notice a cute little image, some text, some additional information, more text, more images. And again, I can just keep, keep clicking through this sway to learn all about the red panda. Kind of fun and a little bit interactive instead of just a standard PowerPoint. Um, I can continue to go through this um, and learn all about a red panda. So very fun. Also down here at the bottom in my navigation, I can go backwards to go back to previous cards, or I can select the navigation, and it's going to show me the different cards within the sway that I can then go and click on if I want to advance. So if I wanted to go look at what the bibliography was, how the student created this sway, I could go look at her bibliography by clicking on it, and it would take me to the card that has all of her references on it, or his references. So that's just a really high level overview of what a Sway is. So it's basically a collection of cards and resources that can be displayed on the web. Now let's go talk about how to build one. So to build a Sway, again, we've logged into office.com and gone down and selected the Sway icon. If you don't see the Sway icon, click on your waffle and then select Sway. Now you have a couple of different types of uh, ways that you can start Sway. You can start a new blank Sway. You can start from an existing document. So you can take a Word document and actually turn a Word document into a Sway. Or you can use one of the built-in templates. Now the templates are really nice because it, like the newsletter template, template, you don't have to come up with the look and feel. It does it for you. So I already kind of built out. And there's a lot more templates that students can use. So like Maybe if they're older students and they want to do an online portfolio or a resume, there's resumes, announcements, newsletters, so many different possibilities. 
I'm going to go ahead and just do a blank sway for our demonstration purposes today. So sway again is very similar to PowerPoint, except unlike PowerPoint that has decks, so your slide deck, so each individual part of a PowerPoint is a deck. In Sway, they're called cards. And you don't have quite as much control over a card like you do in PowerPoint if you want your text to go in a certain place and you want your image to go in a certain place. In PowerPoint, you can say, this is where I want it to go. In Sway, you can't really do that. But again, this is more about focusing on content and letting Sway put the bells and the whistles in. So I'm going to go ahead and build a little presentation here on Yellowstone National Park. Since that's not too far, it's a you know, little ways from where I live, but it's one of my favorite places to visit. So Yellowstone National Park. And just like you'll see in other Office products, if you've got any spelling errors, errors uh, it'll do your red wavy underline. We can right mouse click and choose to spell check. So even though it's web-based, it still has those uh, features like spell check. If I want to bold this, I can bold it, and that's called emphasize. And now if I want to add a background to my presentation, so I'm going to choose background. And because I had Yellowstone National Park typed as the title, Sway, the AI behind Sway, was like, hey, you know what? You might want to look at these images. I'm going to go ahead and choose Yellowstone National Park as my image suggestions. And it's going to give me a bunch of images that are available under Creative Commons. I want you to make note of that, because that's really big in education. We want to make sure that our students are using the appropriate uh, images. So these are, again, under Creative Commons. When I find the image that I want, I can just click on it and choose to add it. And it's going to add it as a background. Now, you can't see this right now. You won't be able to actually see it until I run my presentation. Um, but you'll see what that looks like here in just a minute. All right, I'm going to come back to my Sway, and I'm going to click on the plus sign. And I have some additional cards now that I can add to continue to build my presentation. So I can add a heading card, a text card, images, stack, and so on. I'm going to go ahead and add an image card, or excuse me, a heading card, and I'm going to call this one um, Animals at Yellowstone. Okay, so that is my heading. And I can um, drag an image there, so that would be an image that might show up. I'm going to go ahead and come up here to, uh, to add that image. Now, I can have it give me suggested images. Uh, so again, that's sourcing on the web. Or I can upload from my own OneDrive. Or if I have images that are on my device, I can upload from my device. I'm going to go ahead and do suggested. And I'm going to do this time change to animals in Yellowstone. We'll see what comes up. All right, so there's bear in Yellowstone, there's elk, there's buffalo. So I'm going to grab uh, this buffalo because that's one of the things that Yellowstone is really famous for is their buffalo herd. I'm going to go ahead and click on this buffalo and drag it across. And now that is going to be an image on my title. Now, there's a lot of other animals that live in Yellowstone, so I'm going to go ahead and add an image card so I can add in a group of images. Again, you've got heading, text, images, stack. You have the ability to add media. So if you wanted to add a video or any audio in, uh, you could. I'm going to go ahead and just do image. And I'm going to take my next image. So these cute little bears. I'm going to put them in. I'm going to go ahead and do another one and another image card. And this time we'll do a wolf again and an image card. And a moose. I think we've got all of the big animals there in, oh, we better grab the elk because there are elk there in Yellowstone. So those are uh, all image cards. And this is going to show up here in a different format uh, as I start building my presentation. So whenever you have uh, your, these cards, you can choose to size them really small or really big. I'm going to go ahead and play this just so you can see what this looks like. So I'm going to hit the play button. It's got Yellowstone National Park. It's got that great image. Uh, my next card is my title card, so my picture of the buffalo. Now that picture is not super great, so I may consider going back and changing it. And now as I scroll through my presentation, there are some additional images uh, with the bear, the moose, the wolf, and the elk. I'm going to go ahead and hit edit up here in the top right hand corner and that's going to take me back 
and I can't go in and make any adjustments that I needed to to this presentation. So if I wanted to change how big uh, the bear image came up or the coyote, I could change the card size. So I can do a smaller card, a medium card, or a large card. I'll go ahead and change the bear one to a large card because, or a medium card because they're kind of a main attraction there at Yellowstone. Go ahead and choose play. And again, as I scroll through, notice that that bear image changed and my other images adjusted to be slightly smaller to accommodate. So I didn't do a lot of formatting. It just did it all for me. And again, that power behind, the AI power behind Sway. Now, students can come in and add additional information. So if they wanted to add some information about a bear, they could, uh, or the, the wolf or the moose or the elk. So again, adding another card. You can add a caption, or they could go in and add a text card where they could write maybe some little blurbs about each one of these animals. If you accidentally get a card in that you don't want, you can click on the little delete icon and that will delete. And then you can continue on building your presentation. So I can come down click on the plus sign underneath my last card. I'm gonna do another card and we'll call this one uh, features of Yellowstone. And this time I'm going to go up and do, I'm gonna search for geysers. of Yellowstone. See if I can find my favorite Old Faithful. There we go, Old Faithful Geyser. I'm gonna go ahead and click and drag that over and now that's going to be a background or a section for my next part of my sway. And again, I can continue adding uh, cards, whether text cards, audio cards, but think about this now from a student perspective. How easy and fun is it for them to very easily pull content in and do some writing and not get so hung up on, you know, the backgrounds, the animation, the transitions, the colors, all of that. Instead, Sway takes care of all of that for you. All right, so let's play this one more time, see what it looks like. Um, I got my title, Animals of Yellowstone, my images of my animals, some features of Yellowstone, so Old Faithful Geyser, and then if I had more cards, the additional cards would come up. I'm going to go ahead and come back here to edit and close out of the suggested images. And just want to take your attention over to the left-hand side of the screen to design. Now, design is a way that we can kind of have a little bit of control over the look and feel of our sway. So when I click on design, I'm going to then come over back over to the right hand side of the screen and choose styles. And these are different styles or basically font sets, colors uh, that will really style up our style up our sway. I'm going to go ahead and choose different ones and you'll see that just make slight adjustments to my sway. Now currently this sway you'll notice is going uh, left to right. So as I scroll through, I'm using it to navigate across. If I wanted it to act more like a web page, I could change it to vertical and that's going to change it so that as I scroll through, if I use my scroll wheel on my mouse or I swipe up, it's going to be more like a website, which again, just a different look and feel. Now, if you want it to be more PowerPoint-like, uh, you can choose to have it be slides. And that's basically going to bring up text and images right next to each other, very similar to what we might see in a PowerPoint. So you would click uh, to go between images or between cards. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and escape out of here. Go back to my storyline so I can look at my different cards. Now that's really all the formatting you can do. That was just a really high level overview, but you can go in and the best way to sway is to play. Just go in and start building and having some fun with this. And this is really easy, super simple for littles to pick up on how to do this. Um, but what a fun way to get them engaged in their own learning. Now, once they've gotten their sway all created, it's time to share it. To share a sway, you go up to the top right hand corner, choose share. And you can choose only specific people, uh, anyone within your organization. So anyone within the organization would require that they have a login. So whatever your school district login is, in, is going to be. Or you can say anyone with a link. Now, anyone with a link literally means that if they get a hold of this link, they can see the sway. So this is great for uh, maybe students who 
want to share with mom and dad or grandma and grandpa, a guardian of some sort, they can copy this link and then send it via email or however they want to communicate. They can send it out so others can see it. I'm going to go ahead and copy this and I'm going to open a different browser window just so you can see what it looks like. I'm going to paste that URL into my browser. And notice that it opens right away, and I can go ahead and navigate through this sway. So again, fun way to engage our students very easily, very simply. All right, close out of this and head back over to the sharing options. Uh, now, students do have the ability to collaborate. So if we're, we're thinking about creating a collaborative, engaging environment, if you wanted multiple students to work on a sway together, you could have one student start it, and then they could send their fellow students, their group, the edit link so they could post it in Teams, they could post it in OneNote, they can email it to each other, whatever's the easiest way for them to communicate. They can send the other person or persons the link to edit, and they can now all collaborate together. So again, not just about one student, but bringing many together to create that collaborative environment. Last features I want to show you under the Sway option is under the Ellipse. Uh, you have the ability to go back to, to your own Sway, so that's like your library of Sways. If you want to duplicate a Sway, uh, you can do that. So I've got teachers who are using Sway to make newsletters, and each month they just go and duplicate the previous month and then make any changes. You can save it as a template. You even now have the ability to print your sways or export them. Two great features. Uh, if you needed a paper copy, you could print it or export it as a PDF or a Word document. So if you wanted to deliver this to someone who maybe didn't have internet access, you could give them to them that way. And then finally, the accessibility checker. And the accessibility checker will go through the sway and make sure that it can be read by a screen reader, if it's missing alt tags, things like that. So always great to check your presentations uh, whenever you're making them. All right. So that was a really, again, high-level overview of sway. Like I said before, the best way to sway is to play. So just to kind of dive in and start playing and building. If you're not sure what to build, do a presentation about yourself. It's the easiest way to get started because we always have lots of images, you know, of our family, our pets, uh, our hobbies, things like that. Uh, and you can just start building and then sharing. Let's go ahead now and jump to our next part of our student engagement, and that is Flipgrid. Now, I love Flipgrid because it is such a nice way to engage students and to be able to see their faces. So Sway is fun, but that's for them mostly to create. Flipgrid is really a way for us to have some additional interaction. To log into Flipgrid, we're going to go to flipgrid.com, and you're going to choose to log in as an educator up in the top right-hand corner. You can just log in with your school district email address and password. Once you do that, you will be presented with your Flipgrid screen. Now, I've got some grids here that I have already created, some ways that I've engaged with students and with teachers um, for different activities. Now, you can create your own grids if you want to, or your own topics, or you can use the Discovery Library to find ones that have already been done for you. Let's talk first about just creating one for you and your students on your own topic. So I'm going to go ahead and choose Add a Topic. And it's going to walk me through basically setting this up. So what's my topic? We just got through reading The Secret Lives of Bees. And I want to find out what my students thought about that book. So I want them to tell me about what they um, read in the book, what maybe one of their takeaways was. You could, if you were working with younger students, give them a more succinct writing prompt, you know, something very specific that you're looking for. Like, wh who was the main character? What was the main idea? And it doesn't just have to be about books. Flipgrid can be used in so many ways. Everything from science to digital citizenship, from kinder to higher ed. Everybody can use Flipgrid. All right, so below where we put our prompt, we can choose how long the students have to record, how long their video is. And you can have it be as short as 15 seconds or as long as 10 minutes. Now, I don't usually advocate for a 10-minute video for our kids. I like to keep it short, less than two minutes. That's because I have to watch them. Uh, and I also don't want my students to feel stressed about having to create this really long video. And then you can choose if you want to put closed captions on it or not. 
and then if you want your video moderated. So that means that when the students respond back to you before other students will see it, you'll have to approve it. So this is great maybe if you're doing some kind of an assessment where you want to make sure that they're on track or it's appropriate before everybody else sees it. I'm going to go ahead and just leave mine off and then I'm going to go down and choose my media. This is just a prompt that I want them to answer. So I'm going to go add a cute little glyph to my grid. So I'm going to look for something along the lines of bees. And we'll go ahead and add this cute bees are our friends. That's just going to give a little image so when the kids come into the grid, they can, they can see it and maybe uh, get an idea about what the topic's about. The next section is more about access control. So this is the privacy part of Flipgrid. You can require that students log in with their email address. And this is usually the suggested format. And that way, it just keeps it inside. You don't have to worry about some outside random stranger bombing your Flipgrid grids. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and add my student email addresses. So if I do at, and then whatever their, the last part of their email address is, so I'm going to do at usmie.com, because that's the end of my student's password. Uh, if you have, in your district, if you happen to have where students are at one address and teachers are at another, it's always good to add both. So in my district, we're at dsdmail.net and our students are at go.dsdmail.net. So I would add those both in here if I wanted my Davis School District um, students or teachers to participate. If you want to make your grid public, you can. So this might be fun if you're doing maybe a family grid, so maybe having the students introduce themselves or their parents, and you don't want to have to worry about parents logging in, you could change this to public facing. I'm going to go ahead and choose create a topic, and it's now going to create my grid. To share this with my students, I can choose to copy this. I can give them a QR code. I can embed it in Teams, or I can embed it in Google Classroom or Remind. So lots of different ways that you can get grids out to students. Um, I typically like to just embed it right within my team by copying this URL uh, and then going into Teams and uh, pasting it in the post area or adding it as a tab to the top. I'm going to go ahead and say All Set. And now my topic is ready. So students, when they select the link, it's going to take them into this grid. They're going to see what the thought is, and then they'll have the option to record a response. So really fun. Again, you can see your kiddos' faces. They can see you if you happen to have recorded a video. Uh, they can see each other and respond to each other. It's just a way to create a fun, engaging environment. Now, you might be thinking, OK, this is awesome, except I have kids who maybe aren't super comfortable being on camera. And that's OK, because there are some of us who just aren't. So kids have a couple of options. They can flip the camera on their Flipgrid to use maybe like a rear-facing camera on a mobile device or an iPad or their laptop if they've got a laptop. And they can have it choose to face maybe a stuffed animal or a Lego minifig uh, or maybe an image that they've drawn. They don't have to be on camera. If they do want to be on camera, but they're still like, ooh, just not loving the look of myself on camera, when they record a response, they have the ability to add some effects to their images. So I'm going to go ahead and choose effects and filters. So I can add a cool like rainbow overlay. Um, I can pixelate myself. I can add a color filter. So all sorts of different fun filters that kids can put on. They can also add an emoji. So if they're like, yeah, I just don't want you to see my face, I can put an emoji right over top of my cute little face so my voice is there. But uh, you don't have to worry about seeing my face. Some other effects, um, drawing. So if they wanted to draw on their board. So I just said hello. Uh, they can even add a photo. Lots of fun different ways for, again, students to not necessarily worry so much about being right on screen, but being able to still engage with video in a little bit less threatening, if you will, environment. A little bit lower stakes. So to record the video, they just click on record, and then it's going to walk them through the rest of the process. Now, students can access Flipgrid, again, through Teams. There is an app for Flipgrid, so it will download on almost every mobile device. Uh, they can use the web version of Flipgrid, or if they're on a Windows 10 device, the Flipgrid app for Windows 10. Um, any of those ways, students can access the content very easily. 
I'm going to go ahead and close out of these effects and not record a video. Uh, but we're back at topic. So once the students start recording, you'll see the responses coming into the topic area and you'll be able to go and watch them and then you'll you can then comment back to them, which is kind of nice. It's like giving them a you know a stamp on a paper or you know a sticker that says way to go. You can record a video response back if you want to, or you can just give them written feedback. Either way, you do have the ability to engage with your students. Now, if you're like, okay, that's really cool, but I don't know that I'm quite ready to go like set up one of these topics all by myself, no worries because you can go to the Discovery Library and you can find over 27,000 different topics available within the Flipgrid community. And these are written from by teachers all the way from pre-K through higher ed. And again, on almost every content topic area you could possibly think of. Looks like a new one just got added by ADL about um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. So this is obviously relevant to uh, current events. Uh, if you have EPIC in your school district, an EPIC subscription, there are lessons, uh, Flipgrid topics around EPIC. You can also find ones related to Flowcabulary or Nearpod. Uh, so many great topics within here. Once you find the topic that you want, so I'm going to go ahead and go back and do one on EPIC going to show me some of the different uh, topics within Epic. So one of my favorite books is the Showing Kindness. I'm going to go ahead and select it. It's going to give me uh, what the prompt is. It's going to tell me the age group that it's appropriate for, um, subject area. And then I can go ahead and choose to add this topic to my grid. And I can add it as an individual topic or if I have a collection of topics, um, I can add it to those, that collection. I'm going to go ahead and say next. All right, and then close out. Now, if I go back to my discussion board, oops, I've added it twice, that's okay. So I've got showing kindness in here twice. If I want to edit this grid, or excuse me, this topic, uh, all I have to do is click on the little pencil button to edit, and that will allow me to go in and make any additional edits. So if I wanted to change the writing prompt, uh, wanted to give them more time to record, or change the image, I could do that. And then again, you'll want to go in and add your student email address, so their domain that at, and then whatever's after that, so that they can um, access the grid. If you want to attach any additional uh, information, so maybe a link to a OneNote page that you want them to look at or read, you can attach any additional topics or attachments, excuse me. Uh, then you can set your topic status. So if you wanted to have it have a certain Scheduled time, so due dates, you could change it to active. Frozen means that it's not available, and then hidden means that students won't be able to see it all. And then again, you can schedule your dates. So if you wanted to run for a certain time period, so students only had a window to respond, you could. Uh, and then there's some additional features uh, with the editing or with videos. So if you want them to be able to take a selfie when they're done, be able to add comments, um, have other students like it. There's all sorts of things that you can do with video. And then I'm going to go ahead and just say update topic and, oh, looks like I have an issue because I forgot to put in my student uh, email address domain. So I'm going to go ahead and say update topic. So now this topic is ready for me to go ahead and share. Now let's say that you actually want to read this book to your students because maybe they don't have access at home, um, whatever reason, but you want to read this to them. You can actually come in here and record your own response or if you want to edit the topic, instead of adding media of the image of the book cover, I'm going to go ahead and choose to delete that media. I can record a video of me reading the book. So my kids can come in and watch this, they can hear it. Now, if you're like, okay, that's great, except it might take me longer than 10 minutes to read that story, that's fine. You can do a couple of 10 minute videos um, and really anything longer than 10 minutes, we might lose our students' attention. So you can do a couple of them and give students a break. So maybe like chapters or every so many pages. So you can add that in again, instead of having like a book cover, it could be you uh, teaching or reading or sharing your ideas and thoughts. 
and we'll go ahead and just say update topic and we are good to go. So now again, I can share this with my students through Teams, um, email, QR codes, however you're communicating with your students. So we've talked about the discussion. So discussions are your own topics. The discovery library is our lessons that are already done for you and you just have to copy them into your own space. Activity shows you any activity that you have um, within this community, and you can earn all sorts of fun badges. Mixed tapes allow you to take several different videos and put them into like one long video. So if you kind of think about how we used to record music in the 80s and the 90s, you might put your cassette tape in your boom box and have the radio turn on and then press your uh, play and record button at the same time to capture that song and then stop it and do the next next song that comes up, you would do the same thing and you would create a mixed tape. So lots of different videos on maybe a theme. So a tape on a love theme or a breaking up with your girlfriend, whatever. Those were the 80s and 90s version of mixed tapes. The today's version is uh, collections of videos together. So you can pull student videos together to create one comprehensive. All right, shorts are a way to be able to take a bunch of different videos. So uh, your own videos you can record and then you can like more or less smash them together. This is really fun for if kids wanna record like scenes out of maybe they're doing a book report and they want to do a you know play, if you will, or a PSA, a, a commercial or something of their book, but they wanna, have time to like costume change or have different characters come in, they can record a bunch of different videos and put them all together in one. So that's what they call a short. And then the last thing in Flipgrid is Grid Pals. And Grid Pals are a way to connect with other classes. And you can see here in the United States, there's hundreds of classes, probably closer to thousands of classes that you can connect with based on grade level um, or subjects. And this is like the pen pals of the 80s and the 90s, only it's the cool flip grid pals of the 2000s. All right, so we've covered a lot on Flipgrid um, in a really short period of time. Again, these are just little snippets of how to use the tool, um, some possibilities, and then remember, you can always go take more courses in the educator community to learn more about how to use these tools. Um, again, Flipgrid though, I love Sway because Sway is really easy. Flipgrid is probably the most engaging for for community, having your students to be able to record their video, respond to one another. Um, this is especially nice in remote where kids aren't seeing each other face to face and maybe it's too hard to have cameras on if you're on like a virtual class time with teens or something like that. So fun ways, and they can do so many things. There's like flip hunts. If you go do a internet search for flip hunt or flip grid hunt, you'll see a fun activity that you can uh, adapt for your grade level and your age of students. That's another way to engage our, our kiddos. All right, so with the last little bit of time we have before we open it up to questions, I want to jump into Minecraft. Now, I'm not going to launch Minecraft and like teach you how to play because again, there's a great course in the Microsoft Educator Center, but instead we're gonna talk about what Minecraft is and how you can use it to engage your kids. So Minecraft is basically a flat open world that you can or your students can build anything. Minecraft now runs on not only Windows devices, it'll run on iPads and Chromebooks, okay? Now, for most of you, you're gonna have Office 365 licensing that will allow uh, you to have access to Minecraft Education Edition and allow your students. If you have some of the uh, lower level Microsoft licensing, you may not have Minecraft, but you can always download the trial and try the trial just to begin with. All right, so, once your students have Minecraft downloaded on their computers and depending on what kind of device they have will depend on where they get it. They can get it from the Microsoft Store, the Chrome, sorry, the Google Store, or the uh, or they can come right directly to the website and they can download it from here. So under uh, education.minecraft.net, under support and then downloads and they can download it to their own device. Or if your district has it set up, they can also push it out. 
once students have access to it, literally the sky is the limit. And actually, it really isn't a limit because Minecraft, again, is an open world. Let's talk about some ways that we can use Minecraft to engage our students. Some, just some quick ideas. Minecraft is basically your virtual manipulatives on steroids. So if you wanted to do an activity with your students and have them maybe show you a math concept like um, fractions, they could open up Minecraft and use different color blocks of wool to show you the different parts of a fraction. So they could stack like three red wool blocks and four yellow and show you three fours. So many different ways that they could demonstrate math concepts, Aryan perimeter, ratios, proportions. Again, whatever you can build, you can do in Minecraft. So if you think about the little cubes that your students might have in class, they can actually do that here in Minecraft. Now that was a math idea. Let's talk maybe about some social emotional learning. So that's really important right now while our students are maybe at home and not maybe necessarily engaged as much as they want them to be. So how fun and how cool of a teacher would you be if you said to students, all right, kids, we are going to go do the Mindful Night Minecraft world. And this is a fun world that's already been created by the Minecraft team, and it navigates the students through, and they learn about, learn about different emotions. If you want to check this lesson out, you can go again to education.minecraft.net. Uh, the main page will scroll through a bunch of different banners until you get to social emotional learning and then you can choose to explore sel go check this out uh, as a way to engage your students now if you're like okay that's cool there's uh, social and emotional learning but i want to do something with language arts so giving you an idea here of maybe have your students create one of the scenes out of a book that they just read or build a character from the book that they just read. Students can very easily do that. Again, this is an optional way to demonstrate their learning. Cool would you be if you were like, hey kids, you can do your book report in Minecraft. I bet you would have kids reading books so fast that just so they could get to building the Minecraft world. All right, I've gone into the lesson library, so class resources and then find a lesson. And there are lessons on all sorts of subject, language arts, science, history, math, computer science. There's all sorts of great lessons in here and you can scroll through and look. Now, not every lesson has a world associated with it. Uh, it might be more just getting you started, so a lesson idea, and then you put that idea out to the students. Now, you might be thinking, okay, this all sounds really fun and really great, but I don't know how to play Minecraft, and that's okay. You don't have to know how to play Minecraft. You just have to know what your learning outcomes are, and then that's what they're going to build. And don't give them parameters. You just say, okay, I want you to show me a story or a scene out of your book or build a character. That's it. Let them do all the creative side of it. And that's, again, a really fun thing about Minecraft is it's such a fun, engaging environment. Students have so many possibilities. All right, and then the last thing we're gonna uh, look at within Minecraft are build challenges. Now you can actually access build challenges right within the Minecraft uh, game itself, but I'm going to show you from the Minecraft website just to get some ideas. If you're like, okay, I saw the language arts, I saw the math, but I'm still, that's just not quite, I'm not quite there yet. Minecraft has put together monthly build challenges that you can put out to your students. So they've got one right now on called Be Creative. Uh, here's another one for a creative classroom. So our kiddos can't be in the classroom, but they could design a classroom. So if they had a wish for any kind of a classroom, what would it look like? And then they can use Minecraft to build it. So those are the monthly build challenges. And again, they come out every month um, and they're on all sorts of topics. So teacher appreciation, here's a coding one if you uh, wanted to work with your kids on doing some coding. Um, seasons. Harvest time. I mean, there's just so many possibilities in here. And again, you do not have to be a Minecraft expert in order to do this. You just need to know what your learning outcomes are. Now, your learning outcome with a build challenge is maybe just simply using it as to get students engaged. Like, if you get this assignment done, I'm going to give you a Minecraft activity. If you're like, okay, super cool, 
but I want to go get more about Minecraft, you can go ahead and choose to get trained. And this will take you to the new, the Minecraft Teacher Academy that will take you through, I think it's about 11, I want to say it's 11 hours. It's an 11 hour course. Um, you can just take up bits and pieces at a time as, as you want. And it progresses from getting started all the way through to really difficult things like using coding within Minecraft. So you, again, pick and choose what you want and go through it all or just, you know, the basics. Okay, so that was a lot. Sway, Flipgrid, and Minecraft. Three different ways that students can show or demonstrate knowledge. And I have even been working with teachers uh, using these tools of saying, okay, kids, we need you to do a book report and you can choose how you're going to report back on the book that you read. Do you want to write a, you know, a paper in Word? Do you want to create a PowerPoint presentation or a Sway? Or do you want to build a world in Minecraft? Or do you want to record a video in Flipgrid telling us about it? I mean, that right there is five different ways that students can demonstrate knowledge. Now, for us as teachers, yes, it's five different things that we need to go check. But how much more engagement are we going to get out of our students when they have a choice and a voice in the way that they're um, showing their knowledge? With that, again, covered so much. Be sure to go check out the Educator Center to um, get more training on some of these topics. Um, but now we're going to jump over to the chat window and look and see if there's any questions in the chat window. While I answer those questions, you are welcome to start formulating your thoughts or your questions to either come off mute or uh, take a minute and post them in the chat window. For those of you that are like, okay, I'm just ready to go dive in. I think I'm ready to go do my first flip grid or maybe think about building a Minecraft world or integrating a Minecraft lesson. Um, you're welcome to drop off this call and go enjoy what's left of your morning, afternoon, or evening. And the rest of you hang out with me and I will answer any of your questions that you might have. Thank you again for coming to our session today. Uh, we hope you'll join us back for our last session uh, that's coming up very soon. Thanks so much, everybody.